Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wish to express to you my deep appreciation for the opportunity to present my views this afternoon. I hasten to add that the views that I express today are solely my own. Uh, they do not necessarily represent the views of the Heritage Foundation or its officers or board of trustees. You and your fellow committee members are considering an ambitious and comprehensive health care uh, reform proposal. The draft bill contains both an individual and an employer mandate. As the Congressional Budget Office reported in 1994, an individual mandate on American citizens to purchase health insurance is unprecedented. Uh, I deeply uh, understand and appreciate the rationale uh, for that mandate to offset the cost shifting and to address the free rider problem. Individuals do, in fact, have a personal responsibility to protect themselves and impose no unnecessary cost on the rest of us. Nonetheless, an individual mandate is a restriction on personal liberty. And given the fact that it is such a restriction on personal liberty, I think we ought to look for other opportunities to expand coverage, such as positive incentives combined with mechanisms to facilitate the ease of enrollment in health insurance, and that way achieve a dramatic reduction in health insurance. I've suggested such alternatives uh, in the Harvard Health Policy Review, and with your permission, Mr. Chairman, I would like to submit those for the record. We'll make that part of the uh, uh, file of the committee. Thank you. Okay, and as for the employer mandate, the cost of an employer mandate are invariably visited upon uh, employees, not employers, in the form of reductions in wages or other compensation or even a reduction in employment. In my view, it's inadvisable to impose such a, a mandate, especially during a recession. In the limited time available to me, I would like to focus my remarks on three key areas in the bill, the National Health Insurance Exchange, the public plan, and federal regulation of insurance. The concept of a health insurance exchange is hardly new. Uh, it has had only limited application at the state level. Uh, some may argue that the Federal Employee Health Benefits Program, a defined contribution arrangement, is analogous to an exchange, a national exchange, but I would note that there is no government-sponsored health plan in the FEHB, uh, nor does the FEHB have anything remotely approaching the statutory or regulatory regime that is embodied in the draft bill. The former uh, governor of Massachusetts, Mitt Romney, and state officials who framed uh, the major 2006 reform in Massachusetts uh, developed an exchange. One of the key advantages of that state-based health insurance exchange called the Connector, which one of my colleagues actually is involved with, was that it would allow employers and employees and small businesses to get access to personal and portable health insurance tax-free. In other words, since the coverage would be available through the exchange, and because the exchange itself would be considered group coverage, it would enjoy the powerful advantages of the existing federal tax treatment of health insurance. In my own view, the health insurance exchange is an excellent idea. It should, however, be aggressively promoted uh, as a state institution at the state level. With regard to the public plan, um, the bill proposes that the Secretary of, U of, of the Department of Health and Human, Serv Human Services uh, establish the public insurance plan, uh, and it's to play on a level playing field in the plain language of the bill. However, I would add that in basing the public plan's payment to providers on Medicare payment rates, which are routinely set below the, those of the private sector, as, uh, as Professor Hacker pointed out, the public plan would naturally enjoy an advantage over competing private health plans. Independent analyses uh, show that the use of Medicare payment rates would result in an erosion of existing private health insurance. I would just add one more point with regard to this issue of the level playing field. It has been said constantly, if you are serious about a level playing field, that means that all the rules and regulations that apply to private health insurance must apply, must apply to the public plan. If Congress wishes to achieve a level playing field between public and private health plans, then the public health insurance option, just like any other private option, should be allowed to compete for market share and should also be allowed to fail. That means without being kept on artificial life support through the infusion of taxpayers' money. That would be a key test of congressional commitment to a level playing field. 
With regard to federal benefit setting uh, under Title I of the bill, the Congress would require every American to have health insurance coverage that uh, Congress would define as acceptable. Uh, the bill specifies various standards. I would only say in closing that my concern about the federal benefit setting is that you may very well undermine the creativity of states in insurance market reform. States is culturally and politically different as Massachusetts and Utah have undertaken some very far-reaching and consequential reforms. Those kinds of experimentations and innovations should be encouraged. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It strikes me that we've had a lot of expert testimony all day about how small employers can try to buy health insurance. We've had one person, Ms. Young, speak very authoritatively about what's really like because she's tried to do it. And if I heard her testimony correctly, she put out bids for her business and got eight proposals, all from the same insurance company. And in her testimony, she says in her area, which is Waterloo, Cedar Falls, and Iowa, there are one or maybe two health insurers to choose from. That's not competition. Uh, Dr. Moffat, I want to ask you about the idea of a public option being available to people like Ms. Young and her colleagues to have some competition. And I, I read through your testimony and I identified some criteria that you've identified that would constitute a level playing field, uh, if I read this correctly. You say the simplest way to achieve the state of goal level playing field is to require the public plan to compete for doctors and hospitals by negotiating market rates. That's what the bill does, doesn't it? It doesn't require anybody to take the public option, does it? It doesn't require anybody to take the public option, but if the plan is going to uh, pay Medicare rates, the plan is going to have a, an advantage over private competitors. Well, it's going to pay them for a while, but as I, as I read the bill, there's no hospital or doctor required to take a public plan participant. They can negotiate and say, no, we don't want that. Isn't that right? It's my understanding, too, though. Is, is Am I right or wrong? Yes, you're right. Okay, let's see. Your second criteria that you talk about is that the tort liability. I think it's a very subtle point that the public option would have to have the same tort liability and not be able to hide behind 11th Amendment sovereign immunity. I agree with that, and I think that's a very arcane point we'd have to work out, but, but I, I think you're right. The third thing that you talk about is the accounting standards, uh, that the uh, FASB and other standards that the insurers have to deal with that the public plan would have to as well. Um, I think that's basically right. I think that the bill takes us in that direction. Probably it's not 100% there, but it takes us in that direction. And finally, I think most importantly, you say that the, um, the public health insurance option, just like any other private health option, should also be allowed to fail without being kept on artificial life support through the infusion of taxpayer monies. It's correct, though, isn't it, that the draft before us, the only public appropriation that's mentioned in the bill would be some startup capital to get them started. And uh, would you support the public option if we required that to be repaid out of revenues of the that public option? That would not be the only reason to support the public option. But, but I, would you, no, if we made point, that change, no, would you agree with that? quite correct, but let me just make one other. Okay. Uh, let me make a clarification on this. Um, what I noticed is, when I noticed that and I, and I marked it when I was reading it, and I thought to myself, well, there's nothing in this account. Of course, the next sentence in my testimony is, the question is whether it, 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 there, there's nothing in the bill that doesn't prevent Congress, basically, from coming back and doing precisely that. Well, of Keeping course, there's the nothing prevents us from appropriating on. funds to Bank America or of I, or I, I, I you, Yeah, we you, did that, too. You but, read but, my mind. But you, you do agree yeah. with me here that yeah. the present bill that's before us contemplates the public option having two sources of revenue, premiums and earns, and investment income on those premiums, just like any other insurance company. Isn't that right? Well, yes, but there's one other issue. When this what issue is that? Well, I'll tell you. When the secretary is given the authority to contract for administrators, right? and I'm thinking that the idea here of contracting for the administrators is to contract out with maybe some uh, third-party carrier to carry okay. out the functions of the public plan. Right. The one thing I noticed about that was is that in any contractual agreement, uh, the secretary cannot make a contractual agreement that would involve the transfer of risk which means that in the public plan, the taxpayer assumes all of the risk of the plan. The private sector health plans do not, uh, are not in the same uh, wavelength in that sense. They are going to have to assume risk on their own. But, but my you view is... Okay, I understand your view, but I just want to be clear plan. that you do agree that the proposal before us does not require anyone to take a public plan participant, a doctor or hospital. Uh, tort liability, I agree. There's some work has to be done on that. So the same accounting rules, I think, were basically in the same place. 
-hmm. and that the only revenues that the public plan, uh, public option gets is the premiums and the earned investment income, right? So doesn't it meet your criteria? Are you now for the public option? No, I'm not for the public option. Why not? Other, What's well, missing? Let me, let me say this to you, and I, I, maybe I'll answer the question with a question. I'd if, rather you answer it with an answer. Well, so I'll, are you for, I'll, why aren't you for the public option? Right. <laughs> It meets your criteria, doesn't it? My, my, my view is, is that if all of the health plans, basically, are right. on the same level playing field, we all have the same rules, everybody is guaranteed access to affordable health insurance, and that's right. true everywhere, why would you need a public option? Well, maybe because of what Ms. Ms. Young is talking about, that, you know, in 36 states, the three largest providers have at least 65% of the market. Maybe that's why. Well, I would say that there are a lot of other ways to promote competition than just creating a public option. In fact, Congressman, one of the, one of the problems I have with Professor Hacker's views on this is he's saying we have a problem with consolidation in the health insurance market. My difficulty with Professor Hacker's argument, and implicitly perhaps yours, is that the public option doesn't necessarily solve that problem of consolidation. In fact, it may make it worse because you have, may even have a greater erosion of private health insurance options. My time has expired. I appreciate that. I just thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, continue to go down this, this uh, thought line because I think it's incredibly important that, that the, the fact of the matter is that no public option can be on a level playing field with, the, the, with private uh, industry. Just virtually by definition. Uh, Dr. Moffitt, it, it is the, in, in the bill, would the option or the government run program be required to play, pay uh, local and state and federal taxes? It's not clear in the bill that they would. And if, and if it weren't, wouldn't that be a subsidy to the, the public in plan the and therefore put it on an unlevel playing field? But, in fact, Dr. Moffitt, I just want to know, you don't, and, I, and we can agree to disagree here, you don't support the public plan. My question would be to you, for people to lose their jobs and they close a factory and move it someplace, if, if there's no public option for these people to go into, they're forced to either have COBRA or something, what do they do? Well, I, I actually uh, strongly believe that what you have just talked about is the core of reform of the health insurance market. And that's one of the reasons why I was involved with Governor Romney in creating the connector in the state of Massachusetts, where, in fact, you don't have a public plan. What you have is you have health insurance that's available to people within the market, and they can pick and choose the plans they want and take it with them. It's not necessarily dependent upon their place of work. What we need is portability in health insurance. We don't have that today, Congressman. If we had portability in health insurance, even without spending any money, because we know an awful lot about the uninsured. If we had portability in health insurance where people could, where, where the insurance would tie, was tied to the person, not just simply the place where they work, the, the numbers of the uninsured would drop dramatically. That's what we have to do. That's where we have to get to. Believe me, I agree with you entirely on this issue. We have too many people who are moving jobs, leaving jobs, going from one place to another, and they lose their health insurance. They don't lose their life insurance or their auto insurance or their homeowner's insurance, but they lose their life insurance or their health insurance. And that's, frankly, terrible social policy. And we should fix it. And I would like to see it fixed. A couple things, Mr. Vaughn. You know, you, there's been a, one, I love what Consumer Report does. I subscribe, at least online I do, uh, when I need to buy a new washing machine. You pay my salary. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, but let me say that one of my concerns about this bill, you've always been very consumer oriented, and you were speaking earlier about, my gosh, if the purple pill didn't work, do we have an intervention process? In this 865 pages, which was plain reading for me, there's one paragraph about an obsbudsman. And so my concern is that this is more about government than it is about the patient, that said. Mr. Moffitt, going back to the point of whether or not there's an additional subsidy, frankly, theoretically, until a year ago, we didn't give additional taxpayer subsidy to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, correct? I don't recall. Yeah, they didn't. They just GSE, government uh, whatever. Right. Uh, and so in this document, where we don't require that, there's a one line that says that the public health insurance plan must have contingency 
very left, very, very kind of uh, ill-defined. That's and, contingency margin was the phrase. Yeah, uh, Mr. Hacker in his document says that it would be backed by the full faith and credit of the federal government. Well, that's it. Then the taxpayer's on the hook, of course. Yeah. And that's why I raised the question earlier in response to Congressman Andrews. The I'm with you. Is, Hang on, man. I got the risk. We're, we're in agreement. I just want to make that point because we are on the hook whether or not, and in Medicare as of 2018 we will be, 